Okay. I take it, is that you scanning the screen right now? It is. Okay, all right. Yeah, sorry for the infinity effect. Yeah, I would say we're going to like a visual loop. <laughs> Yeah, so basically I'm recording my, I'm sharing my entire screen, so. Yeah. Um, all right, so I guess I'll go ahead and start. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Bill Sauce, and I'll be um, presenting today with uh, Ben Brown from, from OLET. This is our second panel discussion on online teaching. Our first one was on Monday. The 22nd, uh, Heather Evans Anderson and Stuart Mickelson presented their um, their uh, approach to online teaching, showing their uh, tools that they use and and their classes. And you can actually watch that on the uh, Brown Center uh, blog. In case there is a link to the video from from last week's uh, or sorry from Monday's um, discussion. So this is part two of that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show how uh, I use uh, Blackboard primarily um, when teaching online. And I'll show the different technologies that I use and how I use it. And then I'll pass it off to uh, Benjamin Brown uh, in about, I have about 20 minutes. So hopefully I'll get through everything in 20 minutes and then pass it to Benjamin Brown, who's going to discuss some of the new technologies you'll see in the classroom. Um, uh, starting in the fall. Okay. So, um, so basically, I work from Blackboard mostly, and uh, this summer I'm teaching three three courses, and I'll click in the um, programming for analytics course just to kind of show you. I I basically set them all up the same way, and I follow the uh, ULIT template. Uh, or the IT template uh, very loosely anyway. Um, anytime you have a course, uh, it's all your courses, by the way, are set up in Blackboard, whether you use them or not. And if you click in a new course, you will see it's already sort of set up for you. They give you a template, and then you can go in and make your modifications as you see fit. So they recommend to have a course introduction page, which I do have. Um, and basically, I... I welcome the class. I have a little welcome message about the, the course itself. Um, I tell them about the first day of class and uh, what's required of them on the first day of class. Um, I also give a show a picture of myself just so they get to know me a little bit. Uh, I don't do a welcome video only because my classes are synchronous and I always hold online sessions uh, during my lectures. Okay, and then um, I tell them about Collaborate Ultra. So when they, and this is the first page that they see when they come into Blackboard. Now, I don't know if this is the first page they see by default. So you have to set that up in your Blackboard settings. But once you have it set up, they'll come into Blackboard, they'll see this page. And then I tell them about Collaborate Ultra, which is what I use for uh, lecturing. And I do hold classes every day during the summer, uh, except for Mondays. Um, and for an hour, and this is just telling them that they, they're required to go to Blackboard Collaborate Ultra to join the class, and I tell them when the first class meeting is. I also send out an email with the same information as well, so they're, they're aware of what to do on the first day of class, and then I give a link to the syllabus. So on this page, you can also kind of give the textbooks, so the, the required materials and, and things like that, but everything's listed in my syllabus, so I just give the link to the syllabus and they can read it from there. And I always dedicate my first class to going over that syllabus anyway. Um, and then I have some important links also here on the side that they can click on. Um, I do have a link to the grade book. I have a link to MindTap. Now MindTap is the online learning platform that I use. It's a, uh, from the publisher Cengage. And I'll go a little bit into how that works. But that link actually is a link that will lead them directly to the Cengage course. Okay, now I also have some deep links throughout Blackboard, which I'll show you in a bit. And then I have the Collaborate Ultra link. This is the link that they 
need to go to every day um, to join a class. So again, I meet Tuesday through Friday, and since today's Thursday, this is the only lecture that's available. This will be tomorrow's lecture. And I always set it up, I create the session beforehand. There is a course room that's always open by default. I do lock it though, I don't keep it open, only because when I create a session, students sometimes get confused and they go into the course room when they should be going into the room with the lecture. So, um, so I keep it locked and I usually use this for um, office hours. So if someone requires office hours and they need to meet with me, I'll unlock this room and say, you know, meet me in the course room. And I hold a, a private collaborative session there. Uh, but for the most time, most of the time it is locked. And students are also able to access recordings and it goes back pretty far. Okay, so these are the um, recordings for the past, I think it's about a month right? Anything past a month, right? So all from 527, that's the earliest recorded. But of course, that's not when I started them. But they can always go back and watch them. And during the summer, I don't require them to attend it live. I do hold the lecture from a certain in a certain hour. But if they can't uh, attend the lecture, they could go back and watch the recording. I do require them to do an assignment each day that's related to the lecture. So that kind of forces them to go in and, and have to watch it. Um, and then they submit the assignment by the end of the day. Uh, the reason I do that is because um, during the summer, a lot of students will work. They have summer jobs. Um, sometimes they're overseas in another country. The, the time difference is sometimes a problem. So because of that, I just I see you're not required to come to the class, but you do have to watch the lecture and submit the in-class assignment. So that's how I do it. During the fall, when we went, um, uh, went online in the middle of the semester. I did require everyone to go to class at that time, only because, right, they were doing it all semester before that, so why not, right, still attend this hour. But during the summer, I'm a bit more flexible with that. Um, and I'll go into how I use Collaborate in a bit. And then I also have a link to the Respondus browser, which I'll also talk about. This is the uh, browser that they can download and use to take quizzes and exams. And this prevents them from opening other tabs uh, in the browser to look online for answers. So they can only access the exam. And I also activate the monitor feature, which records them as they're taking the quiz or the exam. And this makes sure that they're not um, using any external sources. I do allow uh, open book, but I don't allow open internet, So, which means I record them to make sure they're not looking at a phone or or another laptop next to them, right? And and I'll go into Respondus as well, okay? And then I also uh, have each week laid out week by week, so um, the students can go in and see what they're responsible for uh, for that week. Um, I always show the uh, obje objectives. Right now, you can actually write these out, but since, and this is what I was talking about before, I have a deep link, what's called a deep link into MindTap. So when they click on this link, it will actually bring them to the course in MindTap. And what's nice, it's a, it's a single sign-on, so they don't have to log in to this system. They just click the link from Blackboard, it goes right into MindTap, and without having them to log in, and it recognize them, right? So here it says, it recognizes me as William, and it shows me the objectives. And I do the same thing for the reading, right? So each week there's a reading. These are the in-class assignments that I give. Um, and these two will link to, to MindTap. So they're required to sometimes do a programming exercise, one or two per day. And they link and they click on this link, and this leads them to the exercise in MindTap. And, um, and if you don't use MindTap, again, depending on the course you teach, um, it's a little bit different, but there's always a lot of nice interactive activities that the students can use. Um, and again, since this is a programming class, this brings them to a programming environment that they can type in their code and it will actually give them feedback. So when they run their code, they can test it as well, right? And click this little checkbox and if it's wrong, it will tell them it's wrong. If it's right, it will say great work. 
So this is, I, this is something I wish I had when I was a student because the students know right away whether or not their program's working correctly before they even submit it to me. And when I was a student, I used to always just be, you know, submit the assignment and hope it was right. So this is a really neat feature. And again, this is just specific to programming, but there are other courses that have similar type of activities that are interactive and give you the, the real time uh, feedback. Um, and then I have a folder with homework assignments and then a folder with the quiz and the quiz I give every Monday. So that's the day I don't hold class. And the quiz again does use Respondus and I do keep it open all day um, and they can take it at any time. And I know there was some concern. We did a little survey that went out and there was some concern with cheating. So I'll talk about how I, how I uh, try to prevent that as best I can. So, so any questions so far? I know I talked about a lot of different things, but okay, so there's some folks asking questions. I don't know if they're being answered as I speak. Um, group studies, okay. Do you re record your lecture every semester you teach? If so, why? Uh, okay, I do, Chas. The reason is because, the tech, because I teach technology, it changes every semester. And the books get updated very often, and the problem sets get updated very often. So yes, I do. Uh, I do do record them. Uh, re I do record them every semester. I don't just put them out there. Um, and I know you could do that if you have uh, if you teach material that's not going to change within the next semester or the next year. You could go ahead and do that, and you can post them on Ensemble. And I don't use Ensemble, but maybe uh, Ben can talk a little bit more about that. But yeah, I, I was doing that, or I planned on doing that when I started teaching online. And then what tur turned out is just, well, you know what? I have a new book this semester. I have new material, new, so it's just, I just do the lecture. I, I treat it as almost the same way as when I'm in the classroom, right? So we still show up every semester in the classroom and teach, even though we may be teaching the same thing the previous semester, right? So uh, that's sort of how I do it. And yeah, it, does, it is more time consuming, but, but that's okay. Um, so Respondus blocks other browser types. Yes. Yeah. So I'll talk about Respondus in a bit as well. Um, I guess since I have this opened, this is my, um, Blackboard collaborate window. Now I always share my entire screen. Okay. You could share an application if you want. So if I only wanted to share my web browser, if I only wanted to share PowerPoint, I can do that. I tend to share my entire screen. So this way, because I go back and forth so many times, different applications, uh, you just sometimes have to be careful. You don't share anything sensitive like student grades and things like that. But I kind of got the hang of it where I don't uh, do that. Um, and and basically, like I just showed the, the, the mind tap environment. That's what I go into during class. And uh, sometimes I do go over slides. If I go over slides, I use PowerPoint I, and I just bring PowerPoint up and I go over slides that way. Um, students can also um, use the microphone, use the camera, but they never do, okay? And I don't make them do that. And they tend to um, use the chat window a lot. So the chat window is what I have up here. This is what all of you are using. That's what students prefer. And um, I don't know why that is. I mean, maybe it's a generational thing because they, even on their phones, right? Do they really talk on their phones anymore? They usually chat, you know, use the, the text messaging. Um, so maybe that's the way they perform, uh, prefer to communicate. That's fine. If they ever have a question where they need to show their screen, I can always um, give them the, the screen sharing capability, right? I can pass, make them the presenter. So as the presenter, they can then um, they can then uh, bring up their screen, and I can see what they're doing and help them. How do you manage chat and talking at the same time? Sort of like I'm doing now. So um, now there's also a little uh, button here where they can raise their hand. I tell them don't bother raising your hand because when you ch when you say something in the chat room, I will hear it. I'll hear the little ding, and I'll go back to the chat window. And I'll answer their question that way. Okay. So, and sometimes they use the mic, uh, but rarely do they use the mic and 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 camera. I always use the mic and camera. 
Um, but again, that's just my preference. So I don't make them do it. Um, and then when I ask questions, like, you know, if I, if I have a question, I'll, I'll ask the class. Sometimes the chat works better, believe it or not, because when you're in the classroom and you ask a question, you'll get that one person that may raise their hand, maybe a little hesitant. When you ask it to a class and they're all in the chat, you'll sometimes get several responses, which is a good thing because then you know kind of how students are thinking, right? You don't just answer the first person and say, yeah, he got the right answer, where someone else, they may have had you know, an answer that may not have been correct, but maybe you can elaborate on their answer and then they'll get it better than if somebody else answers it. So I kind of like the way that works um, with the chat when I ask questions. Um, does Collaborate yeah. uh, record the chats too? It does, yep. Yeah, so as long as the person who's recording it, right? So for instance, if I was recording this right now, it would see all of your text messages up here. Um, now, Chris, you're the one recording it now. So whatever is on Chris's screen, that's how it's going to look when it's when it's published. Uh, students watch live streamers, you two that have live chat. Yeah, all right. IT does not record private chats. OK, all right, that's good to know. So if you have a private chat, then that won't show up. OK, um, so this is how we share the content. You can share a blank whiteboard. I don't use the whiteboard, but I know there's some questions about that. And yeah, you do have to kind of use the mouse, uh, which could be hard, unless you have like a pen, like I can use my finger here and draw up my finger because my screen is touch screen. Uh, or if you have a pen, you can use that. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not a big whiteboard user. I use it some, you know, in the classroom, but um, since I do a lot of chat typing with code and whatnot, I will sometimes uh, go ahead and, um, and just put little comments and stuff in the code. And the nice thing about that is I, the students, when they follow along with me, they usually type the same thing I do, and then they at least, I know they have it. So, but again, this, this could be a handy feature as well. Um, and then you can share files also if you wanna bring up some files. Okay. And like I said, I never use this, so okay, good. You came off. All right. So, okay. So I only have a few minutes left, but but anyway, that's a brief overview of how I use how I use uh, Collaborate. Um, okay. For my quizzes, I actually build quizzes using Blackboard. Okay, and I let me go ahead and edit my test here. And the way I do quizzes is I do pools of questions. Okay, so if you're not familiar with pools, you can get to it from course tools and go into test surveys and pools. You click on pools and here's all of my pools of questions. And I, and I label them by chapter. Um, the reason I do this is one thing is to prevent cheating, right? So if somebody takes the quiz first, they can't give the answer to someone else because they may not have the same quiz. So um, I do three variations of each question and I don't make them too different because again, I want everyone to be tested on the same thing, but I make it different just enough so someone can't give their code to someone else and submit it. Okay, so there's three sets, uh, three questions I usually put in for each pool and then when they take the quiz, it selects one at random. Okay. Um, okay, so these are my three random blocks. So basically you can take a random block and you don't even need to have just one question in the random block. You can have as many questions as you want. So if I wanna put three questions in a random block, three pools, I can do that. And it will select one out of nine questions at random. Okay, which is pretty neat. Um, I also put some links at the top here and the links open external sites. And the reason I do that is because um, the lockdown browser locks down everything. They don't have access to anything on their computer and they don't even have access to other websites. But sometimes you may want to give them access to other websites. If you have, let's say, an open book quiz and you want them to use the ebook, which I do. So I put this little link up here that they can click on and it opens up a separate tab 
and then they can access the ebook. I also have something called a sandbox because they this way they can write and test their code using the Respondus browser using the sandbox. Okay. Um, okay. Once you create your your quiz or your exam, and it's called a test in, in Blackboard. So once you create your test, you can then go into the Respondus Lockdown Browser option, which is also under Course Tools. Okay. Now I actually take off the Respondus Lockdown after I grade the test, because this is the one flaw in the Respondus. If they want to review your feedback, if you've already graded it, they have to use Respondus to review it. Okay, so I turn off Respondus after they after I've already graded it, so they could just go in and review it without having to go into Respondus. Also, it does record and keep all the videos of all the students taking the quiz. So I kind of tell them, look, I, once you take off Respondus, the, all those videos get wiped out. So it kind of gives them peace of mind that we're not here collecting videos of them taking the quiz. Um, Okay, so let me just show you the settings real quick. Up here where it says lockdown browser settings, these are the settings for the browser, okay? Um, so this is not the monitor. This is just if you wanted to use the browser, um, let's say you can use it in the classroom and you don't want them to access other sites online, they can use this in the classroom, okay, without the monitor. Um, there's some advanced settings here. Um, I don't really have enough time to go over them all. The only one that I really check though is the access to external web domains. These are the sites that they can access during the quiz. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky because a lot of instructors, they think, oh, my ebook is in Cengage and they put Cengage.com in here and they think the student can access the ebook. Um, that's not true. Unfortunately, a lot of times the, the site that hosts the ebook is not necessarily the same site that they're going to, to do their assignments. So even though it's hosted on MindTap, the ebook may be on some other web domain. So through a lot of trial and error, I figured out all of the domains that I needed to include so they can access the ebook. And as you can see, it's more than just one link. Um, to refer to that during the quiz. Okay, so again, what you really, the way I did this is I put kind of a link in at a time. I went into Respondus. Respondus will tell you which link it can't hit. I wrote it down. I came back here. I put it in. I eventually got a long list of ER, uh, URLs or domains that um, that it takes to access the ebook. But it is possible. It's just you know sometimes a little bit of a pain. And then down here, these are the monitor webcam settings. So if you want them to be viewed during the quiz to make sure they're not cheating, this is the uh, area you want to come to, OK? Now, this is really neat. I haven't used this yet, but it says you can require the monitor for this exam, which I do in the summer because everyone's remote. But it also gives you the option to use the monitor or a proctored lab. So those of us teaching hybrid courses this fall, if you have half the class in the classroom and half of them at home, right, watching the stream, you can use this link and they can all take it at the same time. So those that are in the classroom, you can proctor yourself. And those that are home taking it online, they can be proctored by the Respondus Monitor. Okay, these here are the different steps that they go through before they take the actual quiz. So there's some uh, additional instructions that they're given, okay. And this basically tells them, you know, make sure that um, there's, you know, you don't have access to other devices. Uh, there's no, if it's oh, if it's closed book, there's no notes, things like that. Uh, then they have some guidelines. The guidelines is, you know, make sure you're in a quiet room. There's no disturbances, things like that. And then there's the student photo. The student photo just has them take a picture of themselves. Uh, very useful for online. Then there's show ID. I don't check show ID only because I know all the students, we see all their pictures, right, uh, on my Stetson, so you know what they look like. I don't need them to show me an ID. I know it's them taking it. If this is more if you were maybe teaching a class you've never seen before, and you don't know if that person's really a student at your university, they have to show the student ID. Then there's the environment check. This one is, is great because 
It asks them to show their workspace to make sure there's no papers or anything around. Um, I have them do this. Now, here's the problem with this, though. The system's not smart enough to know that they're actually showing the desk. So I used to get a lot of this, you know, from the student as an environment check. And I had to tell them that's not an environment check. An environment check is showing your desk area, right? Um, so basically, I put a look, you can edit the text here. And I basically tell them, um, you know, you'll get a zero on this quiz if you don't show your environment. So this way, it kind of forces them, OK, I better show my desk. Um, and um, and that's it. And then they go and they take the quiz. And uh, I know I'm running over time, but I just want to show very quickly what it looks like, OK, um, when they've already taken the quiz, this is what you see. Now, here's the nice thing. It records everyone taking the quiz. But I tell them, I say, I don't watch the recordings, OK? I don't want to watch anyone you know, taking a quiz, especially 10 students um, taking a quiz for an hour, OK? But uh, I say, I only look at it if right, the system flags me that there's possible cheating. That's what this is. So you see where it says low and everything's in the green? That's a meter telling me that no one really cheated. Right. Student A may have had a few more things going on there where their meters a little bit higher than others, but it's still not the, anything to be concerned about unless it gets in the red. OK, so I can actually look at student A so I can click on this plus sign and here's student A. And now I blocked out the face. You know, I don't want to show who this was, but basically um, you can see that there's three flags here where they were missing from the frame. OK, missing from the frame is if they can't see their face, if there's no facial detection. So this student, uh, and it actually shows you when they were missing. So you can click on it, and it will jump to that part of the video. This student just happened to be looking down on, her, on his or her notes. OK, that's all it was. And then it said it was missing from the frame. Um, that's fine. Um, this is not something I would bring to the student's attention. I know that they weren't um, really uh, cheating. I had some situations last semester when I first started using this where I had students using a another device and they would be looking away on their other computer almost the whole quiz and I would see missing from frame throughout the whole thing they would be in the red and I had to tell them I said guys you can't use another computer that defeats the whole purpose of even using the Respondus browser right so and I said it's just like when we're in the classroom I can't allow you to have another computer next to you when you're using Respondus. So I kind of had to remind them of that. Um, but usually a one reminder is all it takes, and then, they, and then they're fine for the, uh, the rest of the semester. Um, and that's basically it. Um, and, and again, Respondus, a few things about Respondus. It is something that they need to download and install. So it's, so we have I have a link here that says download lockdown browser. This is a Stetson specific link. So they have to use a specific link, which may be available on an IT site. I'm not sure Ben can tell us that. But when they click on this, it will actually bring them to the download for Stetson. And you'll see here it says install lockdown for Stetson University. So when they down install this and they run the Respondus, it's going to bring them to Stetson um, Blackboard. OK, so that's how it works. And then I always give them a little test at the beginning of the semester to make sure it works for them. And the test is basically a true false question that says, I don't know, programming is fun. You know, just something that they get used to the browser. They know how it works before they actually take a quiz. So this way I know it works for everybody before they have to use it. And I give them like a little in-class assignment grade for this. So it's nothing that's going to make or break their average, but at least it's something to motivate them to go in and, and do the test. OK. Um, all right, so a lot of chat going on here, but I want to give Ben his time. So um, I don't know if there's anything, if you want to just type in any can. OK. All right, so it looks like, all right, Ben and Harry, you've been addressing these. OK, if anyone has any questions for me. OK, Paula, you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, th thank you for, for giving this uh, uh, intro to, 
to Blackboard Collaborate. I've used it over the spring and um, it, it went really well, except for mm -hmm. a few things that maybe some other people have solutions for or you can guide me. Uh, right. One, I know that you haven't used the whiteboard a lot, but I use it extensively because mm -hmm. in the classroom, I write a lot on the board. So sure. the thing is, sure. I, I bought an Apple pen and I, I use it on my iPad, but then um, it's not very easy to go back to the slides uh, on the iPad because it goes back to the first slide and I it's hard to scroll down. So I have to mm -hmm. be switching between my laptop and iPad, and that was like not very convenient. So I don't know if someone has a solution uh, to using the whiteboard uh, effectively on a laptop. And, and again, I don't, I don't use it as, like you said, so I mean, I don't use it that often. Um, okay, so Missy has a good, yeah, so Missy's saying, how about a, uh, a graphics tablet. Now I know you mentioned you use the iPad, but if you use a laptop, right? Maybe. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Heather recommended that. Um, yeah, maybe mm -hmm. uh, plug in your tablet yeah. and use it that way. Go ahead, Heather. Uh, it's okay. As, or just with someone. I thought someone was speaking. Um, okay. Yeah. So maybe. I, I can. I, I don't use the whiteboard in Blackboard Collaborate. I use it in PowerPoint. I just put a black, uh, a blank slide in and write on that, so that it's with all my other slides. But if I wasn't, if I wasn't using PowerPoint, then you could just as easily white on, write on the whiteboard in Collaborate um, using a graphics pad. It's cheap, mm -hmm. um, uh, easy. It works great. All right. Um, I have uh, two other questions, but I don't want to take time from the others. I know, uh, so maybe someone else if they want to ask questions, and then I'll ask. Okay. Um, ben said, "Ask away." So um, go go ahead. Okay. Huh? Good. Sure. So the the second the second problem I found is that I used lockdown and respondus. Uh, for the final exam and also I had them uh, you know try the environment and do like a, a, a test like write your name or something like that and a true and false and so forth but uh, the problem uh, that some students for some reason uh, the exam was submitted before they finish and they were locked down out of the exam so yes. I don't know what yeah, so I, I can, there's a few things, yeah, there are a few settings that may have caused that. Um, the first one is, I believe it's in the advanced settings. It's this one right here where it says lock students into browser until the exam is completed. Um, what this does is it prevents the user from exiting the mm. browser completely. Um, I don't keep this checked because even if you don't have this checked, they can close the browser, but they have to give a reason why they did. So uh, I usually keep this unchecked for that reason. Otherwise, it will take a, a you have to go and, and put in the thing. Now, the other thing you have to, the other thing is if you go into the actual quiz settings, um, here we go. Oh, I'm sorry, this quiz isn't activated yet. So here's one. So we go to edit the test options, and there is a forced completion. Once uh, once started, right, this test must be completed in one sitting. If you check this, then if they have respondus issues, oh. it will get submitted automatically. Mm -hmm. So some students, they say to me, oh, my, it oh. crashed, and it's submitted automatically. I still do force completion because usually if it's going to crash, at least from my experience, it happens at the very beginning of the quiz. And like I said, they get a, it's, it's a random set of questions. So it's not like they're going to get the same quiz the second time. So usually I say, look, I'll just open up the quiz for you again. I've never had it where a student was working on the quiz for a half hour and then it crashed. Um, but, but again, you know, maybe you don't want to have that on there. But you have to be careful if you don't check this because they could always, you know, 
come off if you're not doing the randomized questions and then maybe look for answers and then sign back in and complete it. So that's why I do check that. Uh, okay. So, uh, so my third my third question actually is, um, uh, you know, in the Blackboard test, uh, there's an option for the students to attach a file. So, for example, if I need them to draw something or solve an equation that's easier to do by hand, uh, I, I thought it was uh, going to be uh, uh, more uh, uh, like uh, friendly for them to write it on paper scan right. it and sub and attach the file yeah. but with lockdown they, they cannot can't do it. attach files so then That's right. they were locked out and the, the test was uh, submitted right. and they they got really okay mm -hmm. yeah so that's the thing uh yeah you do have to if, if you do have questions that require attachments you, you can't put that in the lockdown browser that is that is true um mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that's something to keep in mind. That's a good point, mm -hmm. you know, which which is why I, I try to do as many web based um, assignments as I can. So I was showing you, for instance, the the area where they can write their code in Python. Um, so I have actually I could show you right here. I have a link to the um, sandbox. So they bring this up and they can actually do the write their code using the lockdown browser because it's all web based. But then I just have them copy and paste the code into Blackboard and they submit their code that way. Um, if I were to ask for an attachment, it wouldn't work. So that's why I have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and my last question, I'm sorry, I have so many questions. Oh, that's okay. Um, um, is uh, like when I, uh, the new shell is created, I just copy an old course and then I edit it. So. Will that uh, copy the recordings from last semester as well? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so and I believe that's under customization. Now I only do this once a semester, so um, but customization and right. Let's see. Not quick setup. Oh, maybe it's under package and utilities. Here we go. Okay, so you could do course copy. And you know you can. What's nice is you can actually check any of these. So, for example, if I'm now teaching in the fall, I'm not going to have week one through eight, but I may still want to keep a course introduction or whatever. And yeah, it will actually. I think there's an option where it says you can copy the links to the course file or copy the links and copy the content as well. Right. So you mm -hmm. you have either option. Does, is that what you're asking? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's all in yeah. here. Yep. Thank and then you, so you choose, much. sure, you click the new course up here, and then just mm -hmm. select what you want, click submit, and then it all carries into the new course. So, okay. Um, maybe those questions be in separate exam. Yep. That's a good, that's a good idea. Uh, or set a deadline submission for them. Yep. So those are good good options for that. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. I, I went way over my time. So sorry, Ben, but I'm gonna go ahead and pass it. Uh, well, I don't have to pass anything, right? Except just stop sharing my screen. Because you're a moderator. There you go. Yeah, I think you're good. Thanks. Hi everyone. Um, so let me think where to begin. So today's Thursday, and all this has happened since on Tuesday. Um, let me share my screen. I'm going to show you some things. Let me figure out what I'm doing here. Let me see. Okay. Everybody see? So good news first. Um, I am, we are getting Zoom for the university. Um, I don't know how many licenses we actually wind up getting, but what will happen, I think what will happen is you will log in to my Stetson somewhere and then that will feed you into Zoom the first time, which will log you in, create your account and all that sort of thing. All faculty will get uh, their own 
um, account. I don't know at what level and what sort of things it does. Again, this just happened on Tuesday. And so that's really, I guess, the good news, because everybody really seems to like Zoom. Um, the other thing that has happened is all the classroom technology is getting an upgrade, and that's what we'll spend the majority of our, or the remaining time, um, we'll talk about that, as well as you can ask me whatever questions um, you may have about anything. And the first thing you should know, so every classroom, there's going to be, I'm making some of these numbers, there's 96 actual classrooms that are physical classrooms that we normally use um, that will be getting a webcam that is tied into the current technology along with a microphone array and this will allow us to do two separate different processes. The first process is you can do Zoom or Teams or Collaborate Ultra in the classroom using it just like a webcam. So you could have a um, you could have students only in the classroom and you distance, half students there, half students somewhere else, you only in the classroom, them all distance. Um, again, no model, of course, has been mentioned yet, so we don't know exactly um, what we can, what we will be asked to do with it. But that um, will be there, and it'll work just sort of flawlessly. You log in, you do your thing, you run your collaborate Zoom, whatever session, uh, and it just, um, you know, is there as like a webcam. The second thing that the room will do is it will talk to our ensemble system, and I'm not exactly sure about the process. Oh, you want to see me? Oh well. Well, here's Ensemble. Well, there's nothing really to talk about Ensemble yet, but I'll, I will show you me, because I am very handsome, as we all know. And so the Ensemble, what will happen is um, there's a matrox device in there, and we can schedule that matrox device. And so you can go into the room and start teaching, and you will, um, we can have it to do one, two, or three things. It can send out a live stream that's sort of broadcast, which could be viewed in Blackboard or on a link, and that can happen just automatically without you having to worry about it. You walk in every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. It just sends out the link for students to view the class. It can also record that stream, so if you wanted to uh, do some lecture capture, it will record that, and what we will do is when it records it, we will record it to a library, and we can attach that to um, a playlist, which will be in your Blackboard, and so students could watch the past lectures if you so chose. And you can do that technology in conjunction with using Zoom or whatever. So you can be as automated or not automated as um, not an, an, um, automated as you want. Any questions? What kind of camera is it? It's just so there's going to be on depending on which different classroom. It's going to be one of two types, and primarily it's going to be the, sec the first type. Of it's a PTZ camera, which can pan, tilt, or zoom. And we're not going to really use any of that PTZ functionality initially because it's going to require some programming and we're a little bit under a time pressure. As we move along, we'll be able to work with whatever faculty members are in the room and say, hey, and do things like, hey, I want to be able to hit a button so it zooms in on this group or this group or this station and it focuses on that, or I want it to zoom out and capture more. But again, that's a little bit down the road. Probably after this semester, we can work more on that. Um, can we record a screen? Yeah, so the Matrox device, what it's going to capture is, is both what's coming out onto the projector as well as whatever the camera is showing. So let's say we're um, doing the ensemble stream. What would be streamed is the video, like your PowerPoint presentation over here, and then the video class over here. But what's nice is, is it's, a, it's a dynamic browser. So sometimes you just want a, the classroom. And so if there's only the classroom over here, the user can click it and it just brings up the classroom. Or it does it like a little picture in picture. Or it does it side by side. Or it does this one. It just depends on how the user chooses to display. And so that's a nice feature. Um, any idea how the camera will do with the chalkboards or the whiteboards? Will those be legible? Hopefully, yes. We are going to set up the camera so that the whiteboard um, is the focus, like the whiteboard and the front of the room is the focus on the camera initially for the, every initial shot. And so it may be that the teaching station's not, ex you won't see the teaching station in that shot. It may be that, you know, 
some of the class is not in that shot, but the whiteboard will initially be the focus. And then again, we can work later to make it not the focus. Um, so legibility, we've done a few tests and quite honestly, the key to the whole um, legibility issue is buying ginormous um, markers that we bought and tested. And I'll have to make sure we buy them by the truckload because that's really, the regular dry erase do show up in black, but when you buy the really fat one, it works really well, actually. Chalkboard, we're gonna have to get you some fat and chalk. And I've never tested it in the chalkboard room because we don't have any chalkboards in LBC and that's the only room they let me play around in, so we'll have to do some chalkboard tests. Um, will the camera be placed by the projector? The camera will probably be various places, predominantly in the back of the room, mounted lower so it doesn't see the projector. If it's a long room, it may be mounted to the side of the projector. It just is entirely dependent upon the room structure and just um, the, the dimensions of the room. Two camera types. The other camera, Roslyn, is just a basic, what we call a box camera. In some rooms, that are, I, I can't even think of a good example, maybe in Samsung, there's just some rooms that a bot, like a P, it, there's no need, it's too narrow for a PTZ, and so I think we'll get a box camera. It's actually cheaper, and so that's just the other kind. You should know that um, because every university in America is doing this, um, we're not limited, but we've chosen to get cameras. These are not the greatest cameras in that they're super, super expensive 4K. These are just um, HD good cameras and sort of um, the beginning of the process. You can do lots of great things with more money, but since every room's getting it, we've just gone with the basic and bigger rooms, less bigger fancy rooms like let's say Sage 222, one camera really just doesn't do anything. But, you know, to put multiple cameras that pass off and based upon where microphones are being shot off and such, those runs into tens of thousands of dollars. But the backbone of what we're building in every room, um, this Matrox device along with the microphone array to a camera can be upgraded at any point. So at no, we're not really losing any, um, we're future proofing ourselves. And we may not have students in there. How much is this costing per room? I don't really know. I know that there's been some figures thrown out that were probably high. I would think a few thousand dollars per room, maybe like four or five would be the total cost. There's also some general, we also had to, we have some licensing issues, I believe, in terms of, uh, not licensing, we have to have storage issues, so there's probably money for storage as well. Where do we put all these recordings? The big thing I would like a little bit of feedback about is how would you want to go about requesting or wanting your videos recorded automatically and having a stream in Blackboard? Is that a process that you want to fill out a form for? Is that a process you want to, you know, what's the easiest way to communicate the recordings of videos? Any ideas? Well, the question is, we're going to have all, the, all these professors, and some are going to want videos recorded, and some are not. How do you want to manage knowing? Well, I don't know, Missy. It's a question more of how do you, do you want to be recorded um, automatically, or do you want to sort of opt into being recorded automatically, I think is what I'm asking. Yeah, that's what I think too, Heather. We're going to have to figure out what, how we're going to, what they will, we'll dump all the videos into one library, but you won't be able to keep all the videos because it's too many videos to keep. So we'll have to come up with a process to say, hey, this is a video that's worth storing so that, you know, we can go about uh, keeping it forever. I, I, I have a question I'd like to talk about. <laughs> this, um, so I, I, I get the idea that you'd have these cameras capturing like what's happening in the room, but I imagine you've got like the, the students just sitting there and like watching them. I, I get, I, I don't think that that would be very cool to have a video of just watching students sitting in a classroom, maybe talking to each other and the idea that that camera might be controlled remotely or that that videos of my class and what's going on in my classroom may be going somewhere. 
but I don't know where it's going. Whereas in Collaborate, I can turn it on and turn it off when I want to control the recording and where I'm uploading it into my course. Well, it would just go into a, a, a library, and then the question is, do you want it automatically put into Blackboard or not? You know, and that sort of, those sorts of level questions. There's nobody watching it or doing anything with it other than me, quite honestly. A form, Kirsten? Yeah, I think we may be able to come up with an online form. The, 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 the thing is, is we have to design for both very technologically adapt people, which some of you are, as well as very non-technically adapt, which I don't think we really have those in this audience. Usually they're the ones who don't come to these things. And so we need a way to make it as easy as possible for people when they just want to teach. Uh, Lynn, I have no idea. I'm the lowest person on the totem pole. <laughs> I'm just sharing with you what I know and because I know that there's some interest in what's going on and how we're going to teach in the fall. And um, obviously this is going to play some huge part into it. Um, Heather. Ben, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me, Ben? Yes. Who's yes. This? Who's okay. This? Uh, no, I was just—I was going to ask, um, since all of this is coming down and it's uh, coming down in pretty rapid succession, um, would it be possible to provide like this lamin a laminated sheet of quick steps uh, for operating these uh, capture si the capture system? So, you know, uh, the key steps to getting it working uh, and leaving that attached to the podium or wherever that station workstation is in the lecture yeah, hall? Well, yeah, well, yeah. The, the beauty of it is that either you will use Zoom like you normally use it or you won't do it. If that's just you want to do Zoom or if you want to have the, it captured automatically, you just we will set that up so it happens every Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 930 till, you know, 1045. And you want to do a thing. But that's the process we're determining right now. Again, we just I found all this out on Tuesday, so we're sort of kicking around what we're going to do. Um, Harry, do you have a question? Guess not. Um, let me go back to my chat, see here. Heather, um, I agree 100% with you about asking the faculty, but I'm Again, I'm just the messenger on this one. I don't really know how it was determined what we needed or I don't know who called the, you know, who said, hey, this is what we need. What we need. So, um, Ronette, yeah, the recording, there's no really way to start the recording other than using either the Zoom possibility, uh, if you're doing recording like in Zoom or, or um, um, collaborate, but the other way is no way, there's no button to do it. It just doesn't work that way, not at least at this point. Um, one other thing I should mention is Zoom recordings can be um, tied to our ensemble, your ensemble account. So if you sign up, for, or when you sign up for Zoom and you can save those Zoom sessions, one of the places you can save it to with some integration is to Ensemble. So let's say you had a virtual class and you want to save and it's, you want to save it for um, you know next semester um, because it was such a great class. You had a speaker and you want them to watch it. Um, you could save it, have it integrated with Ensemble. It saves to Ensemble and you can um, um, manage your recording that way as well. Um, uh, so then the camera, uh, the camera's in the classroom, we'll, we'll just review, and it does two things. One thing, it's hooked to the PC, and the PC, it just operates like a big fancy webcam. You've got a um, microphone array and the camera, and so when you bring up Zoom or Teams or anything, it just at, operates like the webcam that I'm looking in now, only in a big fancy level. So you can use all those collaborative tools. And then a separate process that can be running at the same time as that you're doing this is that it, there can be an automatic um, recording or streaming um, of, of the video, but it doesn't have the two-way communication. So we want to be able to offer um, both services um, for different faculty needs. Other questions? Other Blackboard questions or anything like that?
now. Well, it's oh, messy. Yes, I had a couple of Blackboard questions for you that I just was playing around with Blackboard to collaborate this afternoon and um, doing a thing where I was um, sharing the PowerPoint. Um, but I found that even though um, I, would I would click stop sharing, um, but I kept on seeing the PowerPoint for quite a while and it was pretty difficult to eventually get it to go away. When I reviewed the recording, however, um, I could see that this, the students or whoever would have been watching this definitely weren't seeing the shared PowerPoint anymore, but I'm still trying to click away or escape, mm -hmm. escape or whatever to, um, to get out of it. So was there something weird that I wasn't doing or was my computer just doing something weird? I think your computer is just doing something weird. That's not anything I've ever heard of. Um, so if it does it again, let me know and we can look into it. But that just sounds like a, you know, a computer just goofing up there for a minute, not displaying properly. That's what it sounds like. I had another issue too with it. I was um, using the um, the whiteboard and I had done with a graphics pad and I had done some drawings and things. And when I played that back, it was playing back. It, it seemed slowly so that what I was writing on there was kind of choppy. It was kind of, I'm, it didn't oh. seem like it was doing it at the right speed. And I'm doing this on my desktop at home. So, so that's the way it works because instead of streaming video, it really streams snapshots like every right. oh however often so it doesn't show a nice smooth cursive or anything and that's why i always recommend like if you're trying to show a video through the platform just to send out a link in the chat and let them click it watch it and then come back to collaborate because sometimes it works well sometimes it doesn't but certainly on the recording aspect of the whiteboard it um is just taking those snapshots to save bandwidth quite honestly so it's just the recording. It's not so when they're watching it in real time, you know, synchronously, then what? they're seeing it. They're seeing what I'm seeing if it's synchronous. Yes, yes. It, but it can't. If it, it sometimes it will degrade the signal based upon user if they have poor bandwidth issues. So everything, everybody having nice happy bandwidth, yes. But if there's a bandwidth issue, that's one of the re, one of the ways it saves um, power, I guess, for lack of a better word. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? I, miss, I heard some chiming. Um, so, you know, if, if you do have questions, email me on brbrown at Stetson, and um, I'm sure that the powers that be will send out something sometime soon about the classroom technology. But I know for a fact that this stuff has been signed off on and it's coming. So feel free to, you know, disseminate the information that I've shared with you. If anybody else has questions or, you know, have ideas about how we should do things that I can actually do something about, let me know and um, have them send me an email as well. Okay. And then I guess I'll turn it over to Harry and let him uh, wrap up if needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you, uh, Bill, for talking and uh, sharing your knowledge with everybody today. Um, so this is going to wrap up for uh, this session. Uh, it'll probably take uh, a day or so um, for this recorded session to be posted on the Brown Center blog. But when it when it is posted, uh, we'll let you know. But you can always uh, go to the Brown Center blog and look at the announcements um, and you'll see it under the announcements and recent posts. Um, on the 30th, uh, next week, Tuesday, June 30th, that'll be the third and final uh, discussion um, about our online uh, learning. And I hope everybody can uh, join us at that time. And you can always send emails, okay? So that's all I have. Uh, I wish everybody a good afternoon and stay healthy.